A warm welcome to today's talk, Wednesday the 8th of February. Now, I've been looking at the World Health Organization uh, information about vaccines just today, just in the last few hours. And here we have their report on the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, this is what they're saying about it. This is what you need to know. Now, this is the world. So World Health Organization speaking to the world, talking about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And they say this. The vaccine is safe and effective for all individuals aged 18 and over. That's what the World Health Organization has on its website now. That's what they're saying. Now, the reason this is so important is not because we're giving out AstraZeneca in the West. We've given that one up a long, long time ago. Um, but as Covishield made at the Serum Institute in India, it's the same adenovirus vector vaccine. So... And this is from the WHO site. So the WHO are saying Covishield vaccine, the Indian DNA adenovirus vector vaccine, is safe and effective for all individuals aged 18 and over. Now, of course, I'm not allowed to disagree with the World Health Organization, but we can look at some uh, other information. Now, this comes from the British Heart Foundation. Now, quite why the British Heart Foundation has taken it upon itself to be a massive uh, supporter of mass vaccination. I don't really know. Um, but but it, it does seem to be, if you look on its site, so there's the link to its site there. Uh, now, this is the question from the British Heart Foundation website. Is the AstraZeneca vaccine still being used in the UK? Is the question. And of course, we know that all civilised countries uh, stopped this a long time ago. Well, India is a civilised country, of course, but, but um, it doesn't, it's still using it. Um, or Western countries, it stopped using it a, a while ago. Uh, now, this is the answer to the uh, question, are we still using the AstraZeneca vaccine? No, the government is not ordering future supplies of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. I'm pleased to hear Evidence shows that the mRNA vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna, are more effective at boosting from COVID-19. So these vaccines are being recommended for the autumn booster programme. So clearly, clearly, the British Heart Foundation here is saying we're not using the Oxford, Oxford AstraZeneca adenovirus vector vaccine. Do you know why not? Because we've got a better one. Really? Let's look at this data here. This is from the yellow card site. Now, this shows the total amount of uh, vaccine doses given just for the Oxford AstraZeneca. And this shows the adverse reactions reported. So basically, you can see that since the end of 2021, we haven't been giving hardly any Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. Unfortunately, some small amounts still given later on into 2022. And if we look at the scales here, we can see that's 20,000. So sometimes 20,000 adverse reactions reported per fortnight from this vaccine. And yet, according to the British Heart Foundation, it's just because we've got a better one. It's not because there's too many side effects from the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Really don't uh, know here. Now, know why they're saying that. Now, the... Um, World Health Organization says, and I quote, the vaccine is safe and effective for all individuals aged 18 and above. Now, these are the uh, adverse reactions reported in the UK by sex. And we see that um, these are non-serious and uh, the, the, these are serious reports here. And we see that there's a lot more serious reports in women. And of course, we know particularly young women and we know particularly thromboembolic events. So yes, of course, the adenovirus vector, vector vaccines cause myocarditis and pericarditis, as we know that. But they also cause a lot of thromboembolic blood clot events, as well as numerous other things, of course. So the WHO here is saying, in essence, that young women can be given this vaccine, despite this massive excess amount of adverse reactions. Because this is what they say in their current guidelines. It's uh, safe uh, and effective for all individuals aged 18 and over. And yet I'm showing you this data here. 
from the um, yellow card reporting scheme in the UK, which has its limitations, showing that very high level of risk in women. And yet in India, uh, young women can still be offered this vaccine. And there's something really, really gets me about this. The idea that it's okay to give out in India, but it's not okay to give out here. That really, really gets me that. It's almost like two levels of uh, safety standards. Reports by year, well, when we're using it in 2021, we see this massive amount of adverse reactions from the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. And yet it's still being advised as safe and effective by the World Health Organization in uh, India. I can't say the WHO are wrong, WHO are wrong, but I can report this data. Yellow card scheme, Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority, COVID-19 AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, actually, quite a lot of the detailed breakdown where it looked at the particular diseases caused by this, I couldn't find those. It, they probably still are there somewhere, but I couldn't find them. All the new information seems to be to do with the booster program, but I did find this summary here. Uh... Uh, this is the total number of uh, suspected adverse reactions in the UK, obviously before we stopped using it. Uh, 247,410 reports, that's the number of reports. A total number of reports of suspected adverse reactions which were serious, um, so serious from this AstraZeneca type adenovirus vector vaccine, 191,479 um, of course, these are always underreported, so total number of suspected adverse reactions, and I suspect this is very conservative, 876,636. And there's another adverse reaction here that I'm not allowed to uh, report on. So we see, but that number there is 1,357 from UK data. Now, of course, the population of the UK is um, about 67 million now, I think. Population of India is 1.4 billion. Just imagine these adverse reactions multiplied by that level of population. And a lot of them are never really reported because a lot of Indians, the 600 million Indians, live in a pretty well abject poverty. And uh, in fact, probably more than that. And um, uh, when they're sick, very often they won't see a doctor, let alone have access to a, a report. So um, safe and effective... The WHO are saying safe and effective for everyone over the age of 18, um, particularly for young women, all women, but young women especially. That is simply, uh, now I can't say it's wrong, but I can say that that data there is, that data is what it is. Quite, uh, quite incredible, really. Now, the... Um, Authorities, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Authorities obliged me to point out to this uh, contextualization information here. Uh, but it doesn't alter these figures. These figures are... The, the, reason, the reason I put these on here like this is these are screenshots direct from the site. So um, I can't be accused of misinformation, as I often am. So direct from the site. If you don't agree with it, take it up with the... Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority. Now, uh, talking about the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory uh, Agency, rather, not authority agency, yellow card scheme, this is what they wrote, don't wait for someone else to report it. They estimate that 10% of serious re uh, adverse reactions are reported and 2 to 4% of less serious adverse reactions are reported. So uh, that's why we know that these numbers are um, potentially significantly underestimated. Now, the other thing that's interesting is um, this is the Office for National Statistics. And they publish uh, death by vaccination status. Well, when I say publish death by vaccination status, we want to know how many people are dying vaccinated, how many people that are dying are unvaccinated. That way we know the protective effect of vaccines or indeed uh, otherwise. And this data was fairly religiously published every two months. Up until, um, it was published, sometimes published every six weeks, but certainly every two months. Up until uh, the last one was on the 31st of May, uh, 2021. 
So the Office for National Statistics has failed to publish death by vaccination status, having published it previously, very, very regularly, every two months or quicker. Um, and then all of a sudden, they're not, uh, they're not publishing this data, nothing from the 31st of May. So that's June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January. So that's uh, five, six, that's eight months we haven't had that data for. Why not? Why is this data not being published when it was published every two months? Why is it not being published? Anyway, on a completely separate matter, um, here's the latest uh, death figures for the United Kingdom overall. And we see that basically throughout 2022, the black line is what we would expect, that uh, excess deaths are, there's been a higher number of deaths than expected. Um, this looks like it's below here, it's below the dotted line, but of course we have to remember that the five-year average for the weeks 1 to 8 in 2022 were affected by the COVID-19 wave in early 2021, where a lot of people died. So that increased that average. So basically it's clear that there's been excess deaths for all of 20, or pretty well, you can say, certainly since the uh, about March, uh, February, March 2022. And here's a blow-up of that. Um, these excess deaths have just continued month after month. Now, the very latest um, is that actually the excess deaths are relatively low uh, this uh, week. This is the weekend in the 27th of September. Um, let's hope that is a trend and uh, not a blip. But we do see that excess deaths, blue COVID deaths, green non-COVID deaths have been high for all this time. And yet, no satisfactory explanation. We looked at Esther McVeigh, for example, who'd asked questions in the House. And the minister uh, said, well, this is everywhere, so it's not a problem. A completely nonsensical uh, answer. Ridiculous answer. We have got no satisfactory answer to this. Um, yes, problems in the health service are part of it, but not all of it. We know it's not all of it from the College of Emergency Physicians. Now, mRNA vaccine, serious adverse events. Uh, now, this is from this reanalysis of the original phase three trial data, which is probably still about the best we've got, actually, uh, because the government, as we've seen, isn't publishing data lately for the last eight months. Not published the data. So let's go back to this. In the Moderna trial, um, it was a uh, one in 622 uh, had a adverse reaction of... Uh, Serious, what was the phrase? Serious adverse reaction of interest or something like that. Uh, anyway, a significant adverse reaction. The Pfizer, it was one in 990 combined. It was one in 800 over the placebo baselines. Do check out the paper there. It's a peer-reviewed peer -reviewed paper, reanalyzing the initial trial data. Now, these are the latest figures from the Health Security Agency uh, to the Joint Committee on Vaccination. We've looked at before the numbers needed to vaccinate. So how many people do you need to vaccinate to stop one hospitalisation? Table three of this report. Check it out for yourself. The reference is always there. Um, hospitalisations for different programmes. So just uh, I've looked at this example before. 20 to 29 year olds, if they had the autumn booster, people in no risk group, you'd have to vaccinate 169,000 of them. 169,200 to prevent one hospitalisation. You have to vaccinate 706,500 to prevent one serious hospitalisation requiring oxygen therapy or greater interventions. But as we said, oxygen therapy is given out frequently in hospitals, even in a risk group. So we can see that, conservatively speaking, if the vaccine has a significant event of interest uh, in one in a thousand, it's still... Um, and you're only preventing... You need to give 7,500 vaccinations. So presumably that's... 7.5 uh, uh, significant adverse reactions to prevent one serious hospitalisation. It's a ratio of 7 to 1. And that's a ratio of, working out for yourself, 169 um, to 1. That's a ratio of 706 to 1. So um, what, about, what about more at risk groups? 50 to 59 year old age groups. If there's no people have no uh, comorbidities, you've got to vaccinate 43,000 to prevent one hospitalisation. 
and you've got to vaccinate 256,400 to prevent one serious hospitalisation, even in a risk group. You've got to vaccinate 3,100 to prevent one hospitalisation, but the risk is still one in a thousand of the serious adverse events of special interest. So again, uh, I don't think you need to tell me that that number is about three times higher. Um, it's just um, bemusing. So let's uh, see what the great and the good have got to say about this. Uh, here we have uh, someone you may uh, you may well recognize we know that having uh, the uh, third vaccination uh, booster uh, is a very important part of um, uh, immunity to covid and it provides additional protection even if people have had covid uh, or had their first uh, vaccination so um, the programme, the autumn programme, which includes the ability for everybody to come forward, is coming to an end uh, in, on the 12th of February. And I'd encourage anybody who's not taken up the offer to do so before then. You see, that anyone includes people in this category. You know, is he seriously suggesting that we vaccinate 706 706,000 people to prevent one case of hospitalisation or serious hospitalisation requiring oxygen. Well, that's exactly what he's just been suggesting. I, I'm not allowed to say he's wrong, but I'll leave you to think uh, how rational that is. So as we've just noticed, deaths in the UK are actually down a little bit, which is good news. Let's hope this trend really continues because it, it's been alarming, terrifying, actually. At the moment, deaths are only 2.1% above the five-year average. So down, still excess deaths, but down quite a bit. Now, again, on a completely separate topic, we're a bit disparate today, but some people have been making some profits. Um, now, this is from Reuters. You might not be able to see this, but um, Pfizer vaccine with BioNTech, they've made uh, 37, uh, 37 uh, $0.81 billion dollars. 37.81 thousand million dollars in 2022 alone. Now, who's paid for that? Well, you and me have paid for that because we're taxpayers. The ordinary rank and file have paid for that. The elites make the decision. The elites rake, rake in the money. You and me pay and potentially suffer adverse events. Pfizer antiviral treatment, a mere $18.93 thousand million. Moderna, $18.4 billion. Merck antiviral, 5.68. BioNTech, 4.6. We could go on and on and on. The list is there. I put the reference. It's, uh, it's a free, freely available thanks to Reuters. Do check it out for yourself. Western drug makers are estimated to have bought in about a hundred billion hundred thousand million dollars in revenue in 2022 alone paid for by um, us and uh, we have various things we could be spending money on at the moment but that's what our governments choose to spend the money on as we've just seen uh, supported and encouraged by our chief medical officer I'm going to leave it there because I'm not allowed to disagree, but um, thank you for watching.